My name is Jamila Heider, and I'm a PhD student here at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Today I'd like to tell you a little bit about my research, which is on social ecological traps. And I'd like to start by telling you a story. This is a story of two people who have been split into two by the Anudarya River into present-day Tajikistan and Afghanistan. The Pamir Mountains are an area of the world that are extremely mountainous. Only 3% of the land is arable, and it requires incredible ingenuity to overcome these obstacles. So through the skillful stewardship of the Pamiri people, we have one of the most agrobiodiverse regions of the world, which supports their well-being. For example, over 150 varieties of wheat, or 300 varieties of apricot. It's really beautiful and incredible. So despite this, um, this richness that has sustained these people for a long time, this is also a region of incredible hardship, which I'll come, in to, come to in a moment. But I'll tell you a bit of history about the region first. So in the, in the late 19th century, um, in, there was this conflict between um, the Imperial Russia and imp Imperial England. And this is when the boundaries were drawn between Tajikistan and Afghanistan, using the Amudarya River as that border. And the development trajectory of Tajikistan and Afghanistan changed forever here. So here we have the Amudarya starting in the upper reaches of the Pamir Mountains, creating this border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. And I don't think I know anywhere else in the world where the common saying, the grass is always greener on the other side, is more true. So for example, in my years there, Tajik people would often tell me, but the Afghans are better off. And this really surprised me, because from my perspective, being on the Afghan side, I was looking at the Tajik side and looking at the paved roads that the Russians brought, that, um, the schools and the healthcare. But the Tajiks yet were telling me that they were taken off their land and they'd lost their autonomy. So they told me that the Afghans could still produce their own food and they could even make their own clothes. Conventional development indicators tell us the same story. So in Tajikistan, for example, in gorno badakhshan Autonomous Oblast in the Pamirs, we have 99.5% literacy rates. In Afghanistan, in Badakhshan province, literacy rates are under 20% for women. Likewise with healthcare, Afghan Badakhshan has one of the highest, or not the, if not the highest, maternal mortality indicator in the world. In Tajikistan, healthcare uh, could still be improved, but it's certainly much better. Yet, if we see here also, the grass truly is greener on the Afghan side. These farmers have maintained their traditional knowledge and seed systems that have managed to support them for over thousands of years. So I started to think about what locks in a system. Both sides of this river are poor in one way or the other. But how has land use change created, land use change created these lock-in dynamics? And this is what my PhD research focuses on. So in my PhD research, I try to understand what are the dominant or missing feedbacks that maintain these lock-in. And in order to do this, we construct conceptual models to begin with, looking at linking the social and ecological actors of a system explicitly. And then we abstract this into a computational model, something like an agent-based model. And this agent-based model will hopefully be able to tell us what are the key leverage points in order to change the system. And this is an iterative process between conceptual modeling and empirical data. And even though we start with the Afghan Tajik Amudarya river case, we then will take this to maybe six or hopefully even ten case studies globally, where we'll do a qualitative comparative analysis to understand what are the dominant drivers, the dominant feedbacks, or even the missing ones that are maintaining these lock-in states. The results of this research will hopefully tell us what are the leverage points where we intervene. If conventional development inputs are not working, what is it about the system that we're missing? So hopefully we can understand why the lock-in dynamics of the Pamiri people in Afghanistan and the lock-in dynamics of the Pamiri people of Tajikistan are different 
and through which interventions we can actually help alleviate poverty. Thank you.